So um, good morning. It's still morning, right? Um, uh, I am Brian Dake. Uh, I'm with, I work here at the University of Vermont um, at the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion. Uh, we're part of the, the College of Education and Social Services. And, and I'm Chris Kennedy. I am the Regional Director for College Stops. Brian and I actually, both our programs emerged out of the same five-year grant. So we have very similar programs and work pretty closely together through this post-secondary ed initiative. Yeah, so we're part of a, a post-secondary consortium you know, within the state. So we're gonna talk about um, not all of the programs. We have a matrix here. So these are the programs that are part of our post-secondary ed consortium. Um, so we do have the Project Search, which is a high school training program. Um, and at the end, there's the, the uh, peer teaching and learning, um, which is a, a life skill or a lifelong uh, learning opportunity. But today we're just gonna talk about the three in the middle because they're the three um, college-based programs. If you wanna know more about the others, you know, we, can, we can talk to you more afterwards. So I'm gonna start just with our, our Think College program at the University of Vermont. Um, so we were um, federally funded in 2010. Um, there were a number of sort of programs around the country um, serving students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the federal government wanted a, more of a demonstration project to see how effective these could be. You know, because traditionally a lot of folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities were not, you know, accepted into the university environment. Um, so this program kind of changed all that. So we got a five-year federal grant in 2010, so that ran until 2015. So it's currently a two to three year certificate program. So most of our students are, are continuing ed students. Um, currently I have about 13 or 14 um, enrolled in the program. We've had over 40 um, complete the program. Um, and they take academic classes, you know, through um, across 25 different departments when we have 30 different uh, vocational internship sites. Um, and peer mentors is a big part of our program, kind of the heart and soul of our program is that we hire um, college students to provide the one-to-one -one support um, to students. So they attend class and help students uh, just kind of navigate campus um, and uh, go into more detail of these things later. Um, so criteria um, for our program. Uh, transition age, and it applies for you know uh, college steps too. 18 to 26 is kind of the federal definition of transition. Uh, it's not um, set in stone because we have had students that you know, are a little bit older, uh, like to 32. So it kind of varies. Um, but documentation of a disability, um, transportation we do not provide. So people need to take care of that on their own. Um, but basically we're looking for students that do have some, some functional skills and literacy. It doesn't have to be great, um, but we want students to make sure they are, are getting something out of the classes they're in. Um, and they do need to demonstrate a certain level of uh, independence, motivation, uh, stability, uh, flexibility. Um, but really I think what I look for, the main thing is that students really wanna um, continue their education. Um, as uh, UVM students, um, you know, we're, our program is called Think College, but there's really technically no such thing as a Think College student. They're all UVM students and bound by the same uh, you know, criteria and student code of conduct as, as all uh, UVM students are. Okay. Um, so right now we do have, a, our program is a certificate program, but we're starting to see more students uh, in college steps as well of some matriculated students, you know, usually more on the autism spectrum that um, might not need the full program that we offer, uh, but need sort of that peer mentor support. So that's been a, a kind of a new option uh, for both our programs. Before you go to the next slide, yeah. um, I just wanted to make a couple points too around the transition age. So like Brian said, that 26 isn't a hard cap on the age. Both of our programs are peer mentorship programs, right? So it really comes down to a lot of times if we have somebody over that age threshold, we'll bring them to campus, hang out with students, mentors, have lunch, um, do some of our sessions, and we'll look to our mentors um, and to the student, did this feel like an appropriate peer relationship, right? If you're a little bit older and you're looking down, who are these kids telling me what to do? That's probably not a good fit. But in one of our programs, we had a, um, you know, in their 30s, mother of two come to campus. Um, she was really excited about and invested in being in college. Um, she really looked to the mentors for support. 
that felt good to our team, that felt good to her, we moved forward, even though it was above that cap. And to Brian's point about uh, eligibility, I think the biggest two for us are, um, like he said, investment from the students to be there. It's great when parents want students to be there. It's great when teams want students to be there. Um, but when students are just there because other people think they should, they don't get as much out of the program. They're not invested in it. They're not engaging in sessions. Um, so that's a big piece. And then the school's code of conduct. Um, no college student is a saint. No college student, um, you know, is always 100% emotionally regulated. Um, but as long as there's a plan there that the student can follow to make sure that they're abiding by the college's code of conduct, the most simple way I explain that is really like your rights at college um, are awesome, but they also kind of end where someone else's begin, right? Their right to learn, their right to feel safe, um, their just those kind of basic rights. So as long as we can make sure your experience um, isn't infringing upon others, or if there is because there's dysregulation or something like that, that we have a plan to step out, come back in when we're ready, that's not a problem. Um, but the ability to make sure, um, you know, especially behaviorally, that other people are feeling safe, that we're not doing threatening language and um, behavior, that's really what it comes down to. So that investment from students and the ability to meet the college's code of conduct. It's not, are you, do you have academic readiness for college? We work with students that are, um, or at least I have, that are everything from functionally illiterate, and we're being really selective about the courses they're taking. So we're making sure there are courses within their skill sets that they can be engaged in um, to students that are taking classes that I couldn't touch, right? Python coding and <laughs> stuff like that. That's just way over my head. Um, so we don't have a typical student. It really boils down to, do they want to be there? Are they motivated to be there? And can they meet the college's code of conduct? Um, so Chris already hit on some of this stuff, but just student expectations, um, you know, it is a, a privilege, not an entitlement, um, same, you know, code of conduct, uh, um, students do have, um, accommodations, uh, but not modifications. So our classes are typical classes. Um, they can get modif or accommodations through the disability services office. So it could be, you know, extra time on test, uh, taking in the proctoring center or note taker, things like that. Um, but our biggest accommodation, um, is our, our, our mentors. Um, so our program has four pillars. Uh, when we got the grant um, in 2010, the criteria they were really looking for is to be really inclusive programs. They didn't want set aside programs. Um, and they wanted us to address these four areas. So the first being academic, so students enroll in typical um, academic university classes, social and recreational activities to have the full college experience to be part to participate in student clubs, um, you know, the recreational facilities, you know, dining halls, things like that. Um, and the third area, the life skills and uh, self-advocacy to really improve daily living skills and increase independence and confidence. Um, we don't have a residential program um, at Think College at UVM, but we do have a residential option of uh, Redstone Lofts. We have some students living there, but that's more uh, independent living skills. Um, and then the fourth area is career skills and work experience. So usually in their last semester, they'll do a vocational internship, you know, based on their, uh, based on their career goals. So peer mentor is really the heart and soul of our program. So we hire students to provide that support. Um, so the mentors will attend class with students, um, help them with communication, preparing for class, um, reviewing their course, you know, coursework. We do focus on academics, you know, first and foremost. Um, but also developing relationships with peers um, and just really encouraging them. Um, and a lot of it is just navigating, you know, student life and being on campus. Um, just, you know, kind of briefly, just the impact uh, the program has had at the University of Vermont, um, I think it's been big, you know, it's kind of bigger than just our program. So over the course of the years, uh, we've had over 150 uh, mentors, you know, work in our program. Uh, about half of them have been in the College of Education and Social Services, but the other half have not. So we have, you know, all kinds of students um, working for us as peer mentors. Um, as far as with the instructors, a lot of them have incorporated more universal design for learning so that our students are successful, um, but it sometimes has challenged, the, challenged them in classes. 
Um, and then just the college overall, you know, we've been a big student employer um, and it, the program has really just sort of increased uh, the diversity you know, within the university. So um, 10 plus years we've been here at the University of Vermont and we've really kind of grown and become well more known within the, within the, the campus. So I'll turn it over to, to Chris. So that's our thing college program here at UVM. So now Chris will talk about um, college steps. Uh, I always make the joke, me and Brian have presented countless times together over the last decade or so. Um, we have very similar programs, so I love following up on him because he's already explained a lot of what we do too. We're also a peer mentor based program. We started on the same grant together that we are partners on or we are a sub award of the UVM grant. Um, so again, very similar programs. Our college steps programs operate at Johnson, which was our initial campus. Um, next year will be Vermont State University Johnson, uh, the Linden campus, the Ca and the Castleton campus. That's where we have our traditional programming here in Vermont. Um, all of our students set goals in these four areas. So like Brian said, Everybody is going to college and the first thing they're thinking about is it's an academic place, right? I'm gonna take classes. What classes am I gonna take? Are they gonna be hard? So students set goals in academics that might be just to do well in that, their class. That might be to like take more ownership over that experience. Maybe they came out of high school where they had somebody who would always tell them what their homework was and they weren't really tracking that themselves. Um, so academic goals can vary. It can also be, you know, learning specific content area skills, um, content area knowledge and skills for a career they want to go into. Maybe to them, because this is also a certificate based program, that's more important getting the skill set for the career they want than really making sure I get an A in the class or doing really well in the class. Because um, our students have options for how they enroll in the class. I think I'll get into that in the next slide. But um, yeah, some want to be able to earn credits, letter grade towards a degree. Some wanna take classes for credit or, or for credit, but pass, not pass. Um, and some students audit classes. Like we had one student who really wanted to take a financial accounting, right? They had a representative payee, a rep payee, somebody else who got their checks, who managed their money for them. And they said, hey, I'm an adult now. I wanna to learn to manage my own money. I don't want somebody else handling my money. And I wanna take this financial accounting class. Most of the material in that class was super helpful to them. Some of it was pretty heady, like economic stuff, right? And the final term paper was like a 10 page paper that we would have been working on day in, day out that entire semester and playing that game we often do at high school is constantly playing catch up instead of focusing on long term goals. So with that student, they audited the class. There was a couple assignments we skipped because they weren't relevant to their personal goals. And we came up because they were auditing it, right? We came up with a separate um, kind of final project that demonstrated their knowledge and competence in the areas that were important to them, but weren't the final exam. Now they're not getting credits for that class because it's an audit. They can't then use that towards um, a, a different degree in the future, but it would still count towards our certificate of higher education. So. There's a variety of ways um, people approach the academics. Maybe they know they're making a clear transition to employment and a degree is not in their future. They might um, appreciate the flexibility that taking class as an audit gives them and might allow them to take more classes and still be engaged and not overwhelmed by them. Um, and some you know, are dipping their toes in, is a degree path appropriate for me? Um, can I, be successful not only in classes in my area of interest, but classes that aren't in my area of interest. And they wanna take those for letter grades to see, is this the direction I can go with things? Beyond the academics, our students all have social goals as well. The social component is, ask any, any college student, is a big part of college. Um, we want our students making goals in that area because we know also whether they're going on for a degree or not, for all of us colleges, basically the goal is to come out of it with more opportunity to live independently, more opportunity when it comes to what kind of jobs and work you can get. Um, and those social skills are often those, for some of our students, the bigger barriers to employment and continued employment and advancement in a career. 
right? They might be laser focused on their interest in the career they want to do, and they might be exceptional at it. But if they can't negotiate with colleagues, if they can't advocate for themselves to their boss, if they don't know how to access, you know, their chain, their rotating every two week schedule, um, it's not going to go well, no matter how good they are at it, right? So that social piece becomes really important because it's where we practice those soft skills. It's where we practice that self-advocacy piece. Um, some students, you know, a large number of students come in, I want to make more friends, or uh, my social goal is to get a girlfriend or boyfriend. While we're not going to do speed dating or have a heavy hand in that, we do have um, programming and we do work with mentors on, you know, boundaries, um, use of technology. What is texting somebody too much, right? How do you match somebody else's approach to building relationships? You know, if a student sits down next to somebody else in the cafeteria because they have a Boston Red Sox hat on, my favorite team's Boston Red Sox, and I'm going to sit like two inches from you and assume we're best friends already because we both like the Red Sox, that's burning that bridge. That's not going to lead to a successful relationship. The mentors are there to give that feedback, right? And, and while the college may or may not be the point you're exploring that romantic relationship, it can be a place where you're learning effective boundaries, appropriate communication, um, and just where to access support to kind of look into some of those things. A lot of our students, um, our mentors are not therapists. We were having this conversation earlier. Um, and they're not all just like, you know, you don't come into the program and everybody's your best friend, but you will develop some authentic relationships. And those are good people that are your peers that care about you, who can give you the right kind of feedback you need to be making safe choices on the internet that some of the adults in your life might not be aware of. Um, and so that social piece just becomes huge. Independent living, um, while we don't operate residential programs or in that setting, so we're not like teaching people to do laundry, again, self-advocacy becomes the underlying goal here, right? Do you know how to advocate for yourself? Um, some of our students might not, um, you know, yet know how they learn best or how they best process information. So um, do you need to tell somebody to, hey, can, can you slow down so I can write this down? Like, I'm not good at sequencing, so I need to kind of write down the steps to this. It's just so going to all turn to mush because you're talking really fast, as I often do, and I need to slow you down, right? Do they have those pieces to it? Some other students have really like particular independent living skills, like, hey, I'm moving out of the house, whether that's my choice or not. Um, I need to look at getting an apartment. I need to look at how do I vet roommates because I can't afford an apartment by myself. Well, we can give them guidance on that, their peer mentors are going through that same transition or got their first apartment last year or are living independently in the dorms for the first time. These are the people that are living this experience in the same time of the world that they are and can give them a lot of that realistic feedback. Hey, yeah, rent, you could, I could, I figured out I could afford the rent. I didn't realize I'm also paying my bills. And in the winter, it's like twice as expensive because I got to pay the heating bills as well and all these other components that they can give them realistic feedback on. Um, some students might have like, I'm working on getting my driver's license. We're not gonna drive with you, but we got mentors that just did that. We can study the rules of the road. Maybe that's one of your independent living goals. So it's pretty broad. We don't have a typical student. What we work on for independent living skills varies widely. We had one student that was like, I always dreamed of going to college and the only vision I saw was like sitting in the greens in the center, like playing guitar. I don't know what movie he saw that that was the college experience, but that was one of his independent living goals. We had a mentor who played guitar, had an extra acoustic, built it into his schedule. Once a week, they'd hang out. At the end of the year, we had one of our music majors um, take him into the Dibden Center for the Arts, which had a recording studio. He put down Back in Black by ACD, you know, made an MP3 out of it. And it was a really cool experience. And it was very valuable to him, right? And the final one, work experience, right? What is your long-term goals here um, after college? And 
So a part of that is, you know, this whole college experience. A part of that is doing internships. We'll do a couple internships on campus because a lot of our students will come in like, I really want to work with animals, right? Great, let's do an internship at North Country Animal League. The entry level positions there are not playing with puppies. It's doing laundry. It's cleaning up feces. Like, let's get a real feel for it. Oh, I don't like that stuff at all. I'm just going to get a dog when I get a little bit older, and I'm going to focus on a career that's a better environmental fit for me. Um, you know, another student, uh, she just wanted, she was like, I want a professional job working in office because I want to wear heels. I want to dress nice. Like, that's what I want. I've been saying it since I was six. Got her an uh, internship at one of the offices on campus. Like a week into it, she was just like, this sucks. I'm like shredding paper. I'm like, I've never used the alphabet so many times in my life because I'm filing everything alphabetically. Like, I'll find another place to wear my fancy job, my clothes. Let's find something I'd like to do better. She found out it wasn't even like, I want to do this. It's, I want to work in this kind of environment. And a lot of the employment research out there shows it's more environmental than it is like what you're doing, right? She wanted a job with Chumship where she had colleagues that she worked with. It was somewhat informal. They had a good time. They were a crew. We found her a position doing that kind of work. She loved it. And it was nothing she ever thought she'd be doing. Um, so all of these goals that students make, again, like that criteria conversation we had, it's not, what do their parents want for these goals, right? Because their parents' goal for social probably isn't that they get a boyfriend or girlfriend at college. But again, these aren't parents' goals or students' goals. Because if they're not, then students aren't buying into it, right? They're not going to invest in the program. They're not going to show up and think this is about me. They're here because somebody else thinks I should be. Um, do you have the clicker for the next slide? So we have goals in all those areas. I kind of jumped in on Brian's slides with these um, eligibility. For, for us, it's really simple, right? You have a documentation of a social communication or learning disability. You have an interest, like you have an interest in being here, right? I'll be the first person to say college isn't for everybody. Not everybody needs to go to college. There's lots of great jobs, lots of great life paths that don't include college. But if you want to go to college, these programs exist because most of these are public institutions. We're all paying into them. We should all have access to them if we are invested personally in being there. And the final one that um, we have aspirations to be more independent, right? We want to get a job. We see this as a program, as a stepping stone to get a job, as a stepping stone to be more independent and live more independently after. We've had some students who, you know, apply because they want a really fun college experience, but they don't want to jump, right? Sometimes we can work with that and we know we have to get good internships to show some investment in having a career and what money can do for us. Um, but those that are like, I'm all sad, everything's figured out for after college. I just want to come for two years to have a really good time and like take fun classes. Um, that's not what this is about. You can still do that. Um, you can be a continuing ed student at some of these college and get involved in campus, but that's not what our program's about. It's a transition to a more independent and autonomous life afterwards. Um, basically said all these things, um, you know, the outcome is to be more independent, have better career options. Basically the same reason everybody else is going to college. These programs, I feel like just make sure a broader set of individuals can have access to the college to use to transition into adulthood. Um, I, I don't even know if I have another slide or not, but the, the last thing I'll say is kind of, and Brian and I were talking about this before, and I mentioned a, a little something about it um, before, is like these programs need to be authentic, right? And the relationships students um, our building through them also needs to be authentic. So we tell our mentors during training first that like, this is a natural support program and you're paid, right? You are not a natural support. The other people in class are natural supports. The professor is a natural support. Tutoring on campus, clubs, campus organizations, those are natural support. You're a paid support, right? So your goal is to 
be a bridge to all those things to help them find their people and connect to them um, so they can be supported in the same way we all are within our environment by the environment, right? None of us are wholly independent. We all rely on other people. We ask for help when we need it. We need our students to do that. So mentors are, they know they're a bridge to all of that. And every week when we're meeting with them, we're talking about what's your role in any given environment and what's a student's role in that environment so that we can have the conversation, okay, they're getting more independent, right? We're not just scripting what they want to say to the professor anymore. Now they're talking to the professor independently, right? How is the mentor pulling back as they're gaining independence? So they know the last, the worst thing they can do is over support a student. Um, and the other thing that they're kind of trained about is, you know, you're not best friends with all the students, period. And you're definitely not best friends with any of them day one because you don't even know them yet. We're all on a team, we're a crew, but we don't want to shelter students from the experience of how do you actually build an authentic relationship, right? A lot of our students are saying, high school ended, and I don't know where all my best friends went. And it's more likely because that was a relationship of convenience, right? You're all in the same building. You had classes together for multiple years. You built that up. But did you really build a sustainable relationship and have communication in place so it could transcend beyond the high school? We want to make sure our mentors are setting students up and giving them authentic feedback in a really warm way that like, hey, that wasn't building a bridge, right? Whoa, you're coming in a little too hot, like not going to give you my digits. We, we work together, right? I, I don't want you calling me on the weekends yet, but doing that in a nice way. And certain students and mentors will build authentic relationships. We've been around like 12 years. I have students from that same cohort who still communicate and connect with their um, peer mentors from that time, but maybe one or two of them, and some maybe none, but we want them to learn the real skills to build authentic relationships so that they can be lasting and not kind of relationships of convenience. Go ahead. I think that's probably it. Um, the Howard Center here in Burlington has a Succeed program. It's kind of the third one. Mark, who runs that program, isn't with us today. I don't know if you want to jump in on it. Yeah, well, yeah, Mark Pryor was not able to come today. So we're representing these three programs today. So Think College is at the University of Vermont. College Steps is at Lyndon, Johnson, and Castleton. Um, and then Howard Center is in Burlington. And people often ask, what's the difference between Think College and Succeed? Because um, they're both within the, you know, they have a post-secondary ed program um, at the University of Vermont. Um, so those students do take typical classes as well. Uh, but also Howard offers um, some kind of classes just uh, within the, the program, you know, for the Succeed students. So uh, I think that's probably more the independent living kind of classes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing is the residential component. So um, they have a house or two houses, um, so it's required to, to live there. So their main focus is uh, residential and that transitional living. Um, so they've been very successful with that. Um, their criteria very much the same um, as ours, voluntary program. Um, so the transitional living. So they have their two houses, um, guidance philosophy, staffing patterns for a mobile team, front loading, then fading, academic support. So their focus really is on the residential um, and academics. Um, they have those two houses, oops, um, two yeah. houses, and then they have a, a transitional apartment program. So people move from the house uh, to transition to the apartments, um, and then they're very good with helping them get the um, uh, the Section 8 housing and moving out into independent living. So that's the, the main difference between our programs. They both have the post-secondary ed educational component, but Howard has the focus on the transitional living. Yep. But all very philosophically similar to their approaches with students. Yeah. So has to be paid for. <laughs> um, when we had the grant, it was uh, it was funded. Uh, the grant ended in 2015, so that switched over to program fees. So right now, um, uh, Medicaid waiver is the main source of funding for all three of these programs. Um, so our fees are somewhat similar. Our, it's about 9,000 per semester for the program fees. Um, so Medicaid waiver can pay for that. Um, 
Let's see. And, and what I'll say, so the meta, the HCBS, that's home and community-based support, right? So as students transition out of high school, they'll do intake at one of the local designated agencies to be determined whether they're eligible for Medicaid funding or, you know, adult services, developmental services support. They, even if they don't have their own waiver, a lot of the agencies get a grant from the state um, so they can offset those program fees. And even if, you know, a student has what they'd call targeted case management, like you don't get a waiver, you don't really have any support, but it's there if something comes up and there's crisis, there's a pot of money at the state and a special uh, uh, secondary ed initiative funds. Um, so some students that receive no adult funding and really don't get any services can still access that. That can sometimes pay their um, program fees in full. It's very rare that we have somebody who qualifies for adult services who has a financial barrier. If you apply early, if you look into it, we're very good at working with teams and agencies on the funding or putting somebody on the list for the state funds um, as long as we're having conversations early. It's when we hear about somebody, you know, mid-summer who's interested, or qualifies for adult services, but doesn't have any of their own funding, where it's like, ooh, the rest of those funds might be spoken for. Um, we can line it up, but it might have to be for the following year when the next set of funds. So it sounds like a lot financially, but it's rare if somebody is qualifies for developmental services that we can't put those program fees in place um, through a variety of funding streams. And sometimes we also partner with high schools and then it comes out of their special education funding. Um, so the idea would be if a student has transitioned, that maybe they've completed all their coursework at high school, but they have unmet transition goals on their IEP, like working towards a career, exploring post-secondary ed, being more independent in the community, we might contract with the high school to work on those unmet transition goals. And then the high school through IDEA funds, um, would pay for those program costs, those program fees. Question. Um, uh, BSEC this year, um, actually for non-degree grants, it's down to 7,500. Uh, oh, program. good to know. We'll correct our slides. <laughs> right. Um, and that's a good lead in. So we two, there's two different uh, fees. So our program fees, you know, pay for our supports for all three of these programs. Uh, but each one of them, the college tuition is extra. So that goes to the university or the college. And yeah, VSAC has been, our partner has been a great uh, uh, resource for that um, with their enhancement grant, which is called now the non-degree grant, um, which has been increased. Um, and then uh, Voc Rehab or Higher Ability has been putting uh, up to $2,000 per year toward tuition. So that's been a big help. So for a lot of our students, between the two of those with VSAC and, and higher ability, it's been able to pay for the tuition. Yeah, because they're taking one class. Some students might right. take more classes. That might get to the point where it's out of pocket. Or if your family income is such that you don't qualify for the VSAC non-degree grant, there might be out of pockets, but the assumption by VSAC is that you can cover those. But the DV, the higher ability or VR contributions of like a thousand per semester up to two thousand per year um, can be tuition. That can be books. Um, sometimes they will cover costs related to transportation or meal plans if that's a, a barrier to post secondary ed as well. So um, definitely make sure you have an open case with higher ability. Yeah, I'm just some. Slide go here a little bit farther because we want to make sure we have some um, questions. Um, it's interesting because the, the the labor presentation earlier had a similar slide. Um, so what I found, and I think Chris will agree, over the the twelve years or so we've been doing these programs, is it doesn't matter so much which classes students take; um, they gain something from it. You know, a lot of it is just from the college experience. Um, and what soft skills employers are looking for or is communication, strong work ethic, initiative, um, personal skills, and teamwork. Um, and these programs, I think, really do a great job in helping students develop those, uh, those soft skills. So communication, you know, they're taking classes, um, you know, they're working in small groups, they have to work with their uh, co other students and professors. So just and a lot of our students take uh, um, public speaking classes. Um, that's been a pretty popular one. You know, so they gain communication ability, both written uh, and verbal communication skills. And a lot of the parents have, you know, you know, attested to that. That for better or worse communications. <laughs> yeah, yeah, have improved. Um, strong work ethic that students take 
typical classes with high expectations and they complete these vocational internships um, to show initiative. Uh, just being a college student, students have to show uh, motivation and, and uh, initiative to be successful. And just interpersonal skills is huge, you know, just by being a university student, interacting uh, with the mentors and their other classmates, um, really develop those uh, interpersonal skills. And then teamwork, um, coursework, and just being part of these programs, I think. All these programs are really good at helping students kind of build up those those soft skills. And like in the previous session, they said that's what employers are looking for. You know, the initiative being shown up, you know, showing up on time. And then once they get the job, they'll teach you the specific skills that you need for that job. Um, so they don't necessarily you know learn those in the class, but the classes you know help them uh, develop these other um, soft skills. And. Uh, Fun fact, we did won it. We won an international award for our post-secondary ed uh, consortium with the Zero Project. Um, and uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. Yes. Yes, yeah, we, um, we're we seeing more students sort of needing that support. So I think both programs have had students that are uh, full-time matriculated students that could really benefit from the peer mentoring support, which is not an accommodation that's offered through student disability services. Um, so actually higher ability has been a resource for that. So we have a couple of students in our program right now in Think College at UVM who are getting peer mentor support uh, but the fees are being paid for by higher ability. So they're getting probably half the support that the other students do, but they just sort of need that extra peer mentor support to be successful. So that is an option. Our, our typical program, our certificate program is usually two to three years. Standard is two years. A lot of students are opting for a third year, which is fine if they have the you know, goals and funding for that. Um, but then we do have like, I have one student in the program right now who's a full-time matriculated student. So she's in it for the four years or five years, however long it takes her to get her degree. So we're providing that peer mentor support until she finishes. And that's what higher ability is paying for. The students that, that have applied, uh, they applied to, and got into UVM first, and then they contacted us for the peer mentor support. So, yeah. and it, it's similar with us. Our program at Castleton right now has four students that are full time living in the dorms. We don't provide residential support, but they meet with mentors on campus to navigate those courses, break down big assignments, you know, stay on track of stuff. Um, and we're seeing more and more need and referrals for that level of support. And sometimes our students that are on that track will do like, you know, 15 hours of support a week the first year where they learn to advocate for their accommodations. Um, and then in subsequent years, that'll be scaled back once they get those habits in place. Maybe they need five hours, a couple homework sessions, meet with the coordinator once a week. And I think we're both really good at what does this individual need? more than like this category of students it looks like this over four years it's what does the student need we'll work with you yeah, higher ability is a great partner they're always wanting to make sure we see students over the finish line um we had one student that did two years we didn't see them for two years and then we worked with them again in their final semester because they had a big um you know a lot to do to get over that finish line with their final courses mm -hmm. yeah we're all flexible we had a student do do the two-year certificate program with us. Then she applied to UVM and got in as a full-time student, got her bachelor's degree, and then stayed on and got her master's degree. So um, it varies. Are there questions? Did any questions come in through that? Okay. Well, we don't need to keep you longer, but we, yeah. we have a few minutes if anybody has personal questions or wants to come up and ask, but otherwise reach out sure if you get a peer mentor 
I find once we have a peer mentor, we have them until they graduate because they really value the job and the work they do. Uh, but each student doesn't get assigned like one peer mentor, right? So like one of our students might have an academic peer mentor that goes to class with them and then does homework time with them a few times a week. They might have a, a couple social mentors, maybe one that goes to the club that they're interested in because they are also interested in that club. Um, so most of our students will work with four or five different mentors a semester. And when those, if authentic relationships emerge, right, and somebody works really good, we, we want to, you know, um, see that carry on and see that relationship build. And that mentor is in a better position to help support that student and give them feedback in certain ways. So we want to see them working through, but our mentors are also full-time students. So we put a lot of effort into making sure those um, strong relationships can transcend more than one semester, but a lot of it's logistics and when they're graduating. But um, yeah, we work really hard to intentionally match students. Like the building of schedules is a, a feat. It's a huge puzzle um, of mentors, mentors availability, where are they good at, who do they work well with, what are their strengths, what are students' needs. It's it, it, um, but it's all student center. We don't plug hours into, uh, you know, create a schedule online kind of thing. Um, but yeah, most students work with four or five mentors a semester and might have one or two that carry on for most of their semesters. Yes. Um, if there only be one or maybe two classes, is this a five-day program? Is it like a half-day? It's usually three days a week. Um, so the classes are either Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. So if it's Tuesday, Thursday, we add a third day. So we provide, I think, college steps to about 15 hours a week of peer mentor support. Um, so students are usually on campus three days a week. Often they have jobs they'll do when they're not on campus. Um, but we do have some that will come five days a week. Um, but a lot of it's independent time because we can only offer so many hours of support. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and similar for us. And you know, Johnson and Linden that don't have good public transportation options, we have uh, many students that do those fifteen hours over two full days, like their Tuesday Thursday class, Monday Wednesday class. They're on for those full days just because transportation is tricky, but. Um, but yeah, and some students, you know, they might take two classes that might be appropriate. Maybe they do 20 hours. Somebody that's been in the program longer, they may do five, 10 hours, but they might stretch that over three days because um, they're independent. They have their own friends that they're eating lunch with. Um, you know, they're involved in clubs or they're over in the library for a few hours in between classes studying. So it can build out to be a pretty full schedule even with 15 hours. Well, thank you for coming and our, our contact information is here. We have websites. I think our material is still on the table out there. So um, I took all my yeah, materials right. off the table already because I got <laughs> it here if you need any. For sure. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.